Welcome to the 42nd episode of the Friday Nightmares podcast. This episode, we'll be talking about everything associated with wedding horror. I am one half of your hosting team coming to you from Waterdown, Ontario, Canada. And with me, as always, is Mr. Smoke Show Crawford coming to you from the town of Sports Creek in the county of Genesee, in the state of Michigan, in the United States of America, in the North American continent, in the Western Hemisphere, on the planet Earth, in the Milky Way galaxy. Fully vaxxed, waxed, and ready to climax. And if you can, please get me wet and feed me after midnight. The longest intro ever. I know. It's epic. And the thing is, Scott and I took 12 minutes for this to get started today between Scott's computer not being able to use Zoom, him freezing, my Bluetooth speakers not working. Um, It's like our systems are reacting how we were last weekend slow and um, a little bit delayed because that's exactly what happened to us. (laughs) Scotty, how was your trip to Canada? Oh, the trip was absolutely incredible. You are such a wonderful host and just showed me a great freaking time. As everybody could see from our many videos that we shared, uh, Heather got smoke show pretty damn drunk. And Which is great because he's never welcome back. Oh, um, Scott, you got you're the reason there was a bar fight. <laughs> I was the reason. <laughs> yeah, just I got you know my awesome dance moves. I don't that's, blame them that's for what wanting happened. to fight. They were so angry with you. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, all joking aside, we had a really good time. Thank you to everyone for watching our Facebook live videos. I went back and watched them later to make sure that they weren't like really bad, and they were fine. Like we didn't say anything ridiculous. I don't think. I think they were all pretty healthy. Yeah, so I think all were fine except for like what was it? The night on the on your back porch, you could totally see me drunk just in their house. Oh well, we just weren't drunk. We were also high. We just didn't say it in our video at the time. But right, (laughs) we'd also smoke two fatties. Like let's also put that into perspective as well. Um, so you enjoyed Niagara Falls that. So as for those of you who didn't watch our videos, Scott went to Niagara Falls for the first time before his birthday. I took him there for his 40th. Um, And there is this zombie 3D ride that we wanted to check out. And anyway, we go on it. (laughs) And I just want to mention that I got first place. Scott got second place, respectively. Um, And the good news is it was only Scott and I on this ride. Yeah, we kicked ass. And it was probably the cheesiest dumbest shit i've done in niagara falls and i've done a lot of dumb shit in niagara falls and this stuff (laughs) takes the cake like the graphics this was new like this was only built like five years ago and it was horrible like it was just i don't know yeah the 4d part of it was fun it was the uh, the computer animated graphics of like trying to shoot zombies that just looked it it reminded me of like the old house of the dead arcade game graphics oh yeah like it was i would say house of the dead was a step up um but yeah it was anyway so we got first and second place respectively which was very exciting and then on saturday i'm kind of jumping around we saw christian luciani from the exploding heads podcast which was awesome for anyone who watched that live video um and we watched friday three on a 3d tv with 3d glasses and i have a new appreciation for that film now yeah, I've always enjoyed that film, but yeah, seeing it in the true real 3D that Scream Factory put on that disc, it was freaking incredible because it was like that subtle 3D mixed in with the like obvious 3D stuff that goes shooting at the screen. And I really love that. I thought it was really cool. It was amazing. I honestly, that was way better than the fucking video game thing we sat in. <laughs> right. Um, and Christian is an awesome host. Shout out to Christians if he's listening. He's just, and him and his wife, like, holy fuck, I think they're vampires because they look super young. They have three kids. They have a beautiful German shepherd. 
um, just awesome, awesome people. And we had a really good time. Like, we were there for almost three hours and I wasn't sure how much time Christian could give us. He's a very busy person. Uh, he has a family, but he managed to just put that time aside for us. And I thought that was really nice. Yeah. And I was going to say, and I got to give a shout out to his uh, daughter. Um, what was her name? Jocelyn. Jocelyn. Okay. I thought it was, but I uh, got to give a shout out to her for uh, giving me crap for saying I like the forever purge better than the rest of the movies <laughs> that was great she was like what is wrong with you and we're like yeah, she straight up called me like, out oh yeah makes sense um and then you went to hamburger by uh gordon ramsay which you are spoiled now and red yep. robin just doesn't do it for you anymore yep every burger i've tried since then just tastes like cardboard and garbage <laughs> and uh, of course we went to the drag show at absence and that's where uh, there was this bar fight which is really funny so we were there fairly late i think we stayed till almost 1 30 in the morning before we took some ubers home and um my one girlfriend stuck it out with us so she's there and we're dancing on the dance floor the drag queens are performing like it's just the party scotty's dancing because he's lit and everyone else is dancing and it's a nice atmosphere you don't feel yeah. self-conscious you know, like everyone's just spreading the love and shit. Anyway, so I go upstairs to use the washroom because at this club, the washrooms are upstairs. And I come down and I see these two dudes going on it at the dance floor. Just, you know, typical drunk, you know, asshole type behavior. Anyway, and then my friend Ann is, I guess, pulled Scott out of the fight because he didn't even know what was happening around him. Nope, I was just sitting there having a good time. And next thing you know, my arm was getting grabbed. I didn't even know by who. So I had to turn around real quick and as soon as it was Ann and she's just pulling me away out to the outside. And I'm just going, what the hell's going on? And yet apparently there was a fight breaking out right next to me and I had no idea. Well, yeah, you would have got trampled. I'm so glad she was paying attention anyway. And then I just watched these two push each other. And then the best part is one of the queens got in between them and like fucking pulled them apart. And I love it. <laughs> nice. I was like, you guys are losers. Stop fucking fighting at a fucking drag show. Yeah, you're, um, you guys are Canadians. It's supposed to be all friendly. Jeez. Oh, uh, you know what? These were young, young people who were um, full of alcohol and haven't been out of the house in a long time. And, you know, not excusing the behavior. I don't ever think bar fights are OK, but, you know, people have a lot of pent up aggression, I think. Right. So. And when there's alcohol involved, you can expect that can possibly happen. Yeah. People don't think clearly. Right. They just they don't. Uh, yeah. But Scott made made tons of friends, added a whole bunch of friends on Facebook, uh, including some of the queens. Um, yeah. Like Scotty yeah. was the bell of the ball. Everyone loves Scotty. Yeah, I uh, leaving on Sunday was like a, a uh, bittersweet because I was excited to go home just because, you know, long week, uh, short weekend, but long because I was just. Oh, beat. it was long because we were busy. Like it was yeah. go, 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 go. Like we but were... at the same time, I didn't want to leave because like hanging out with you was a freaking blast meeting, finally meeting everybody that you have told me about throughout our entire time, knowing each other, finally getting to meet them and them really digging me and like, yeah everyone just treated me amazingly and it was such a fantastic time and i so can't wait to come back which is hopefully new year's hopefully new year's i said to scotty if you thought this was a fucking party <laughs> you have no idea. oh i can't wait um and really like friday night like friday when scott got here we had lunch and then we went out to niagara and we were out in niagara for a couple hours but niagara's really expensive for anyone who's been down here and it was hot as hell yeah um, Oh, it so, was so freaking hot. But, you know, Scotty visited our own little liquor stores, the LCBOs here. And he also, and, and really, we hung out at my house Friday night. We didn't go anywhere Friday night. We literally just hung out in my backyard and drank and ate nachos. And um, one of my friends came over and hung out. And, you know, it was it was very chilled. So it's not yeah. like we were out and about every single moment. It was just we were doing things. There was no sit down and let's watch a horror movie because we could do that anytime. Right. right. And it's nice weather. Like probably if he comes up here over the cooler months, we might end up having a downtime where we throw on a horror film because you have a little bit less to do. But right. yeah, I was going to say, and plus like that Friday night, you know, it, it was a long, it was a long, but easy drive for me. So having the going out to Niagara and having the fun that we had, but also cooking ourselves with how hot it was. It was nice to be able to just come back, relax, and just drink on the back porch and chill for the night. Yeah, it was a really relaxing evening. So I'm really glad that Scott had a good time. Hopefully he comes out again for New Year's, um, depending on what happens with COVID and 
his life in general. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? He may be, you know, he's a smoke show. So he may have <laughs> multiple ladies that he's entertaining on New Year's Eve for all I know. Multiple so. ladies. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, multiple cats he's entertaining. <laughs> um, let, me, let me introduce you to the multiple ladies. Rosie and Lucy. <laughs> oh, these are his hands that he's <laughs> introducing us to everybody. Hey. At least they're cheap dates when you take them up for dinner, Scott. No, uh, they're not that cheap anymore. They, they're, they're starting to get tired of my shit, so they want more. They want a ring on those fingers. Oh, do they? Wow. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> and you're what, a couple? So this was for Scott's 40th. Now, it was early just because life is, uh, Canadian Thanksgiving is earlier in um, in Canada, over the States. Like Thanksgiving falls over Scott's birthday in, up here in Canada. And plus, my dog is going for a second ACL surgery this Wednesday. So yeah. uh, Scott came up early early about a month before his birthday to celebrate an early birthday which was fine because it was also my friend amber's birthday so we were able to get sweets for both of them and um sweets by treats like cheesecake and shit just in sweets case. for but, the sweet yeah, well for amber amber it's a sweet not you um <laughs> aww, aww. <laughs> though the best was that video with Anne. so for people who oh. watch the scott's a bitch video that was a throwback to the year before. So the year before on Amber's birthday, Scott was hanging out with another podcaster in Michigan. I was out and we were having these drink off videos. So I kept uploading ridiculous videos. And one of them, I said, to, I did the same thing of like, what is Scott? And Ann said, he's a bitch. And Scott got super offended. It was a big joke that we had going on for a long time. So this was our chance to reenact it in person. And that's why we did that. <laughs> and that was like, I've watched that video multiple times. And <laughs> really I just funny. love it. It is. <laughs> so you can hear me crack up in the background. <laughs> yeah. Like, you, like as soon as you look over and see my face, I hear you just start chuckling. <laughs> <laughs> it is the best. It was really, really funny. So thank you, Scotty, for being such a good sport. And uh, oh, thank you I'm, for being such an amazing host and like taking care of me while I was out there. Yeah. You had breakfast each morning. Big breakfasts too: pancakes, French toast. Egg, oh yeah the work hash browns i know people are gonna think this is an airbnb i mean hell she even went as far as to go out and buy tea bags because i don't drink uh coffee i drink iced tea for my caffeine she went as far as and bought freaking tea bags just to make me iced tea so i had my caffeine in the morning which is just but, very thoughtful well yeah i wasn't gonna be like don't have any caffeine <laughs> suffer <laughs> that'd be a pretty dicky thing to do um and also you don't forget your canadian goodie bag that you left with yes oh, all the canadian treats that you've given me so she got me a kinder egg which i did find out are not illegal in the states anymore they oh, used good. to be good i'm glad that you guys have progressed right but uh yeah for those that don't know kinder egg is just a very thin chocolate egg with a hollowed out inside with a toy in it it was banned in the u.s because apparently kids would just toss the whole egg in their mouth or something and choke on the toy because they didn't realize there's a toy inside so we eventually had plastic eggs that just had the toy in it and they call them kinder eggs and then we now in michigan we at least have regular kinder eggs but then she got me these uh treats called joe louis which uh for Americans, remind me of a mix between moon pies and ding dongs. Moon like, pie. They're just like so light and fluffy. They're very, very sweet and yummy, uh, but they're chocolate with a cream filling. And then she gave me a big old box of Smarties, which are completely different than the American Smarties, or yeah, American Smarties, which are chalky, supposedly fruit flavored crap. Uh, these chocolate Smarties are uh, almost like remind me of M&Ms. Did you like them? I did. Yeah, I really nice. liked them. And I ended up taking some into work to give to Joan and she loved them. Oh, nice. Excellent. And then and then she brought me my favorite chips, the all dressed ruffle chips, which are one of my all time favorite flavors. Now, I freaking love it, wow. which, by the way, I did a comparison. The American version of all dressed chips compared to yours. Your guys has way more flavor. Well, you know what? Canada is just all around more flavor. We got the flavor. Oh, it's, flavor. it's flavor town over there. It's flavor town. <laughs> well, I'm glad you had a great time. Um, you know, it was so nice to see Scott again. It's It's been almost two years since we hung out. Yeah. And it was great to get, like, we see each other a lot. Like, we record, we're friends, we talk all the time. Like, it's not, you know, like it was foreign to seeing each other. But 
you know, there's something to be said about him being able to meet the people that I love um, that are important to me and And be able to hang out in person. Yeah. Like it was, and to do stuff like now when I refer to like absence and stuff, cause I've been to see Scott. So I think we forget that I did (laughs) see Scott at his place. So I do, when he makes references to certain things, I know what he's talking about for him. He had no idea, but now he has an idea. If I say the Walmart or going to absence or whatever, he knows what I'm talking about. Like he can kind of gather in his head what exactly that means so that's kind of cool yeah but um and meanwhile we managed to watch a fair amount of 2021 20, movies or i've managed to watch a fair amount of oh you and i both did because i have seen a good chunk of these on this list as well all right well let's get started let's dive right on in all Can right you see this first one nope that one is you oh boy so this movie is called prey i feel like there's a lot of movies coming out <laughs> called well, prey well there was one just last year or two last right? year and it was the one with like the chick with the dog yeah the shepherd um which i did like german shepherd this is also a netflix movie it is a international film it's basically about a group of dudes that go hiking for a bachelor party and then turns out they are being hunted so it's a survival flick it is 86 minute runtime um, it is subtitled. It's it's fine. You know, I found it entertaining enough. I do enjoy survival films. Do I think this is a, a really great horror film? No. Do I think it's more of a suspense thriller? Yeah. Um, it was entertaining enough. If you enjoy survival flicks, it's a free watch on Netflix, so you can't go wrong. But don't walk into this thinking it's hardcore horror because it's not. Um, and that's Prey on Netflix. Nice. Yeah. Because I remember hearing you talk about it. It didn't sound like something I was going to really want to jump into right away. No, I would say like if you're bored one day and you just want to watch something survival, then go ahead. But I wouldn't say that it was anything that you need to write home about. All right. Uh, So, yeah, the next one, uh, you and I both watched this. Uh, It is uh, free on Tubi. I believe that's the only place. Let me see. Oh, no, it's on Amazon, Google Play, uh, YouTube, Tubi. And I'm not sure what that blue clipboard. Oh, Microsoft Store. Um, but this is oh, it's also on Flex Fling in Canada. Oh, okay. Or Flick Fling. Flick Fling. So, Flick Fling. Flick Fling. I like the name. I know. <laughs> but uh, this like is something else. <laughs> hey, right? Flick the bean. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyways, uh, this is a uh, Tales of the Uncanny, which is a documentary on the history of and anth- horror anthology films. Great documentary. And, yeah, this documentary was really fantastic. Like, if you are a fan like us of horror anthologies. This is a must watch because they talk about freaking everything. Mm-hmm. Like they go from the very beginning to what was like 1926 or something. That was the first yeah. horror anthology. Yeah. yeah. And then just yeah. like go by each decade and talk about all of them. They bring up some obviously big hitters, but then they also bring up a lot of ones that we've never even heard of. And we watched a lot lately because of oh, our yeah. top five. Oh, yeah. There were tons that I hadn't heard of, which I tried to write down as it went because I yeah. just was so interested in seeing them. Yeah, I was. Uh, this is just definitely one of my favorite documentaries that I've watched this year, because after the last two years, I used to say slashers were my all time favorite subgenre. I think anthologies have become my favorite subgenre. Yeah, because there's a little bit of everything. You know, it's like a little treat mix bag. Exactly. You, know, you just don't know what you're going to get. Yeah, so I highly recommend this. This is like, especially if you have Tubi, it's free. You just got to deal with some commercials here and there. I highly recommend it. It is a great documentary, especially if you're a fan of that subgenre. Yeah, I think Scotty said everything that needs to be said about this. It's a 104 minute runtime and it doesn't overstay its welcome. It's extremely educational. It's entertaining. You'll see a lot of familiar faces in this and you'll and you'll hear about some greats like Vincent Price and, you know, what some real or horror icons did for the genre. Um, it's really interesting. And the guy that plays Loomis, Donald Pleasance. Yes. Um, and it was nice to see him talk about something else other than Loomis um because he's in some of the shorts yeah and you know it was really it was really cool to see that so yeah one with his daughter too if i remember correctly yeah it was him and his daughter man did they look like twinsies it was oh yeah they did (laughs) so our next movie will be in our future review so we won't go into too much details with it but it's called slash slash party this was actually recommended from charlie i saw charlie talk about this uh charlie's a writer for pop horror and friend, I'm friends with him on Facebook. And he mentioned this movie and said, you know, it's it's indie, it's low budget, but I really recommend people check it out. And of course, Scott and I are a big fan of the indie low budget films that are out there. And I watched it. I think I watched it first. Yep. And and Brandon watched it as well. Our friend. Brandon yeah, I, was like, I think Brandon watched it. Then you watched it. Then he? I watched okay. it. And Brandon was like, you know, this film had no business being as good as and entertaining as it was. 
And this is, again, low budget done right. Um, yeah. yeah, there's some acting in it that you can tell they got some of their friends to act who are probably that great. But there's some people that were really good. And the special effects they had that were done well. Yeah, I was going to say, and like, uh, they made the character, like the, the characters that were over the top in this were purposely over the top. Like, that yeah. was just what they were supposed to be. So, like, yeah, if you go that go in knowing that in the first place, I think you'll have a good time with this. Because, yeah, this was... Uh, a fun little, I guess you would say, hidden gem in the, this year. Because yeah. like, yeah, I had no idea about it until like you and Brandon talked about it. Absolutely. And it's a 79-minute runtime, so it's way under an hour and a half. Perfect amount of time for this movie. It's edited well enough. It's available on Prime and uh, Prime for free if you have Prime, and then you can rent it on Amazon. If you have Prime, I definitely recommend checking it out. Um, Sander Kane, who's also a friend of the show, gave it three and a half stars on Letterboxd. So that tells me nice. that it's a really good quality movie, because as much as we tease Sander, he has very good taste in films. Yes, he does. Um, so Especially you know, in the indie scene. Especially in the indie scene. He knows a lot. So I recommend checking it out. We'll be talking about it more later in our in our wedding section. Um, but yeah, if you got Prime and you enjoy fun little slashers, check this bad boy out. Yep. Com- I couldn't agree more. It's it's a very, very fun, low budget film. Now, uh, have, have you seen this one? Yes, I have. Oh, perfect. I'll let you talk about it then. All right. So the next film is Shelter in Place, which is uh, during the global pandemic, uh, which limits the possibility of travel. A couple is basically, basically... March 2020. Is yes, going pretty much. <laughs> Uh, but a couple is stranded in a Hollywood Roosevelt hotel where a, it's a skeleton crew of two people running the hotel, basically taking care of their needs because no one else is there. And, well, things kind of go bump in the night and other weird things start happening and be kind becomes kind of, in a way, supernatural, if you will. Um, this is one of those films where it's very uh, relationship heavy mm-hmm. and which is, of course, you know, my cup of tea freaking dug that. But it's mm-hmm. basically about these uh, v- very well off people, a uh, very well off couple, I should say, one who basically just does like vlogging and makes her money from there. And I'm not sure what the other guy does, but they treat the I feel staff like he like- got stock broke trading or something. Okay, I think like that, that might have been yeah. it. Yeah. But yeah, they were really well off. And just like some of the people that are well off, they treat the help poorly and disrespectfully. And like, but yeah, there's just a lot of tension and drama between them as well in their relationship with what's going on. Because he's not working, so he's jealous of what she's able to do while being sheltered in place. Mm. Like, she can still make money doing her vlogs. So like, there's a lot of that like relationship uh hierarchy uh tension going on between the two of them and between the staff and like the haves and the haves nots um and that's not even including the spooky stuff that happens with the supernatural things happening in this part uh, hotel like i really dug this i thought this was for a low budget film uh pretty damn good yeah i thought the film overall was good i just hate that it had to take place during the pandemic i'm kind of hashtag over Um, using the pandemic as like a launch board. I wish it had just been, they were staying at the hotel and there was a really bad storm and they couldn't leave. And they, and this stuff was happening personally for me. Um, yeah, I think that, I'm not over that yet just because uh, I, I know we're still going to get a shit ton, shit ton more of these films. Well, you're a very, you know, it's funny. So Scott's recording in his office and all I see is these pets walking by. So Caesar's walking <laughs> by, which is one of his cats. Like, it's like all the cats are coming by being like, what the fuck are you doing in here? This is not convenient for us. <laughs> How the hell are we going to crawl on top of you if you go here? Right. This I'll is please. bullshit, man. They're not pleased. But yeah, I think Scott liked this one a lot more than I did. So, I, but I will say the acting is good. The writing is good. It just wasn't something that really spoke to me. Um, but I wouldn't say it's a bad movie. So if you like Scott's review of it, and it seems like something you would want to check out, it is available on iTunes, Google, Voodoo, Microsoft Store, and YouTube. I would say if if what Scott described is your jam, a three ninety nine to four ninety nine rental is sufficient. Yeah, and I agree. And uh, it's also on Amazon here. Oh, is it on Amazon in the states as well? Okay. Yeah, I think it's on Amazon to rent. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Our next one is a low budget anthology that another fresh, another podcast called Fresh Cuts covered recently. Who are they? I don't know. Some cut, some guy, Mike Merriman and Venom, some stud muffins. Don and Ellie and this other Don and Ellie. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they're just hanging out, reviewing (laughs) movies. Actually, I'm really happy to see they're doing more um, VOD and stuff like that. I'm really glad to see doing that. They did a lot of that because of the pandemic, but I'm really happy to see that they're doing more indie stuff. 
So this very badly wants to be trick or treat. Oh, Um, so does. Which is fine. There is nothing wrong with wanting to be trick or treat. Trick or treat is a great anthology film. It's a 104 minute runtime. Some of the stories are better than others. Uh, The dude from Scary Movie 2, the guy that plays the butler is in one of the shorts, which I enjoyed seeing. Um, They all do connect together a little bit loosely, but for the special effects that were in this, they were good. They were entertaining. Um, I did enjoy it. Do I think that it's as good as Trick or Treat? Of course not. Um, did I have fun enough with it as a little Halloween anthology? Yeah. If it was on TV, would I watch it? Yeah. Like I yep. would I go out of my way to watch it again? Probably not. Um, but it was entertaining. It was nice to see something different. Yeah, I, I agree. I ended up uh, just finishing this over uh, like the past couple of days. Um, one thing that I think uh, makes me like it a little more maybe than you do is uh, the two radio hosts. Well, mm. one of them is Corey Taylor, the lead singer of Slipknot. And oh. the uh, and that was uh, Chili Billy. And the other one um, that was the one kind of in the other booth, that was Zach Galligan from Gremlins. And once I realized that, I started catching all of these Gremlins references throughout the movie. Like oh when God, Corey, when Corey Taylor would say something to him, it would be about like, hey, better not eat after midnight. I know what happens when you eat, eat after midnight and stuff like that. Oh, going, is that why? I just thought they were making Gremlins jokes. I was like, oh. Yeah, it's because he was in Gremlins. <laughs> oh, my God. No but yeah, I agree. So much. What was that? I said, no wonder you liked it so much. <laughs> oh, I didn't like it like nearly that. Like, I, gave, I think I gave it a seven out of ten. Like, it's a very fun anthology. Like, I would uh, some of the shorts obviously hit. Some of them didn't. Um, but I like there is a creature that comes up later called Lenny that looks absolutely incredible. Um, but all in all, I think this was a fun anthology. Definitely not the best out there, but, uh, but not the worst. Yeah. I was going to say like you, if it was on TV, I would definitely sit down and watch it. Um, would I watch it again? Like just choose it to pick and watch. I would probably do that if I was just kind of rotating through Halloween themed horror films. during Yes. October. Yes. Yes. Um, I would I definitely, this is available on Amazon, Voodoo, Google, Microsoft store and Amazon. I think it's worth a rental. If you really like a Halloween films and anthology. I think you'll enjoy this. I think yeah. it's worth a $3.99, $4.99 rental. Like there was effort and love put into this, this film. It's just don't expect it to be like trick or treat. It's really trying hard to be trick or treat. And you know what? Let it try hard to be trick or treat. Yep. There's nothing wrong with having role models. Exactly. And that's okay. So the next one is hashtag like. Um, you, you saw this one too, Scotty. I did, but it was so long ago that I don't remember <sighs> really much from it. Yeah, it was okay. Um, I watched it because I know Scott mentioned it um, before. So I guess I'm just kind of catching up to it now. I don't think Scott was overly impressed. I wasn't overly impressed. I feel like it tried to conquer the sexual harassment area that occurs. I just don't think it did it super well. It is Mm -hmm. for free on Shudder. So if you're trying to get through 2021, the acting is great. The, The dialogue between the young lady and the main dude that's in it is is exceptional i just found it kind of boring like it just didn't really hit for me um scott doesn't remember it which usually tells me that he didn't really like it so yeah yeah if it doesn't stick with me there's a reason i would say do you skip on shutter and uh, there's other better things on shutter yeah agreed and next one we have <laughs> is old and i was so excited to see this movie uh, Scott watched it as well. <laughs> a lot of people we know have watched it. Two stars, four stars, two and a half, three stars. I think that's all pretty fair. I'm sitting between a two and a half and three star on this for sure. Yeah, I think I'm at a three star. All right. Yeah, it says three star in here. It's a hundred and eight minute runtime. Basically, um, you know, it's the most recent movie from N Night Shangong and Ding Dong. And it's... <laughs> You know, a family goes to this resort. This resort is populated with people that have been early diagnosed with something, an illness of some kind. And, you know, they they go to this resort and then, you know, selected families are given the opportunity to go to a secluded beach and then horrors occur at this beach. Um, The acting was horrible. I don't know where they got these actors from. Well, and that's the part that saddens me. Um. The one actor was uh, the boy that ends up being like the teenage teenager version of that boy. Yeah. He was the uh, son in Hereditary, which he did fucking amazing you know what? there. 
I will give here's here's the thing when I say the acting's bad. I thought the kids were the fucking highlight of this film. Okay, yeah, that is yeah. and in every role they were in. I thought and the mother and the main dad were okay, but the other family members that were there mm. were dreadful. Yeah, and like there's just so many plot holes. Um it's not really like obviously it's M. Night Shyamalan, so explanation is out the window. Um it's an interesting concept. I got to give it that. Yes, but, I do think it's an interesting concept. But there's certain parts where it's like you see these kids getting older and yet somehow they are mature, like talking like mature adults, even though they are still kids in an adult body. I, that part threw me off. See, that setting what threw me off. It was the poor fucking writing and line delivery. I mean, it was totally that, too. And the constant like and and I I liked the overall premise of why it was happening. I thought that was clever, but the cheese cheese ending was like, come on M night Shyamalan. Like the part at the resort. Yeah. Like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> like it was just, and there's an ending dialogue that occurs in a helicopter. And I was like, kind of like, <laughs> like, come on. Like there were parts where this was a roller coaster movie. There were parts where I was like, oh, this ain't that bad. You know what? Like this is some good like body horror or this is some good emotions that it's pulling from me. And then there'd be other parts where I'd like, get the fuck out of here, movie. Get the yeah. fuck out of here. Right. So it was really a roller coaster for me. Yeah, same here. Like it was, I would say it was entertaining enough. That's why I gave it like a three out of five or a six out of ten because it was entertaining enough to where I wasn't bored. But at the same time, like I, I could just feel my eyes rolling back in my head so many times, just like, oh my god, really? I think as an M Night Shyamalan fan, I was disappointed. I had higher expectations for the film. Yeah, because um, you are definitely much higher on him than I am. Like I don't mind him, but I went into this going, eh, let's see, see if this is going to be one of his turds or one of his good ones. I think if the dialogue had been better in the acting, like the premise didn't bother me. The premise, yeah, the premise and the logic of that shit, like you kind of, you're right. You have to like. Suspend disbelief in M. Night Shyamalan Ding Dong movies. Like, you've got to be like, none of this makes fucking sense. So I'm just going to go with, you know, whatever world he's creating for me. But it was it was the acting and the line delivery or the directing. I don't know what happened to his directing ability because it was just, to me, it was the delivery that made it poor. Yeah, I was like, yeah. And I'm lower than you on my rating. I'm a five out of ten. Yeah, wow. I I think that's because you are more of a fan of his, and you were more disappointed. Yes, that is where me. I think I went in kind of expecting what I got. Right. So, anyway, it's available on Amazon, um, and you can rent it here in Canada on Cineplex. You know, watch at your own discretion. Like it's it's not the worst movie I've ever seen. I just expected more. Yeah. Yeah, I, I expected about about that with maybe better dialogue. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, so the next film is on Netflix, uh, not Netflix, Shudder, and it is The Columnist. And I don't think you've seen this one yet, Scotty, have you? Nope, this one's on the list. So this is really interesting. Um, it's basically another revenge type film. I believe it's a German film. It's an 83 minute runtime. It originally came out in 2019, but didn't get over here to North America till this year. Hence why it's a 2021 watch. Um, a columnist is being bullied online, which we see all the time. Uh, people are online warriors and on keyboard warriors and feel the need that they can say whatever they want online with zero consequences. Mm-hmm. And this is just represented in this film. But it's nice that it's not a teenage girl that it's representing or, or being, you know, targeted to. This is more of a adult that it's being targeted to. And this person takes revenge in a way that, you know, somebody possibly would. I put this in the same realm of feeling that rent a gave me. Oh, really? Not the same kind of movie. Let me make this clear, but it gives me the same kind of feeling like in rent a okay. okay. I would say I'm... as good as rent a but it gave me a similar feeling. Wow. All right. So yeah, I will be watching this as soon as I can then. You don't really know who the protagonist is. Much like in rent a nice. you have a hard time. Like that movie was very emotional. Yeah. Right. This isn't as emotional as that. I, I think it's hard to compete with rent because it was so well done. Um, but this one did have a certain level of emotion to it. So Anyway, it's available on Google, YouTube, Microsoft Store, and of course, Shutter. So if you have Shutter, I definitely recommend this over hashtag like. 
Nice. Yeah, this is one I will definitely get to as soon as I can, though. I think the only reason I have not watched it is because it's uh, in a it's a foreign film, so it's subtitled. Yeah, and Scott doesn't know how to read. Well, no, it's because I got to wait till I'm home and I have not been home. To Scott watch doesn't it. know how to read. I, I just admit the truth, Scott. It will be quicker. <laughs> I just can't read. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Can you imagine, though? You did come up here and see signs in French. You couldn't read that. I tried. <laughs> you tried, and you were like, "What the fuck?" Um, anyway, you've seen, I forgot about this gem purposely, <laughs> so you remembered. So why don't you talk about this bad boy? All right, so this is one that has been blowing up in the horror community. Uh, came out, I think, two weeks ago, and is still being highly talked about or hated. Uh, it is very, one of the most divisive uh, films of this year, I think. Um, mm-hmm. cause I've seen people say, oh my God, this is my number one film. Love, 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 love it. Other people going, this is And those people film. are stupid. <laughs> just kidding. Just and there are other kidding. people that are just like, I absolutely fucking hated it. Worst movie ever. And I'm meh. And those people are also stupid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this movie is James Wan's return to horror for Malignant, um, which is... A movie that I'm sure everybody has heard about right now because it's talked about constantly, mm-hmm. but it's um, basically James Wan's nod to 70s and 80s giallos or gialli, if you want to do it the plural way. But um, so it's got a lot of the beautiful. Well, sn- that was supposed to be a giallo. G- 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 giallo, yeah. Giallo. Yep. What? Hence, hence why I was uh, making fun of like, oh, yeah, it's totally an homage to those films because, you know, bad acting and terrible writing oh my god (laughs) so yeah uh, but yeah that's like the uh especially when it comes to the cinematography the cinematography in this i have to admit absolutely stunning beautiful beautiful. breathtaking and it definitely follows the stylings of like a lot of the italian film directors from back then um however this movie was a chore to get through for me the first two acts i found just completely uninvested and did not care the kills were lame the uh the weapon of choice was cool the killer before you realize what it was like was interesting and was definitely a, not a giallos because it was the black gloves black leather black hair just like hiding in shadows but it's basically like in a revenge film but then the third act happens and that's where it goes goddamn bonkers and i i enjoyed it but for i enjoyed the last act but for the wrong reasons because i was laughing at how ridiculous and stupid it was (laughs) so this film i didn't hate it i didn't love it i'm in between with it like probably sitting at about a 6.5 or a 7 out of 10 like it has its moments and the third act is definitely the payoff and i have to give James Wan and the studio that released it credit because putting this out in theaters, this type of film to a mainstream audience who's probably going in thinking this is going to be a typical scary story like James Wan is known to tell very ballsy because I don't think these people, those people are going to go in liking this. And that's probably why people didn't like it, you know, and, and I will not say this is worthy of a number one movie of the year. Obviously, if this is your opinion, I'm not going to tell you you're you're wrong. Obviously, you're, you know, like what you like, man. I just think that I I think filming wise, beautiful, beautiful filmed movie, as Scott said, like, I won't take anything away from that. I think that the writing was where the problem was. Mm -hmm. um, And the way that the actors were coached to deliver the lines. Yeah, because you know Um, it was done purposely that way too. But it just it just doesn't work for me. Like it just is it it was painful at times, and I was like, cut the fuck out of here. Like this is, you know, this will just sit in the middle of the heap for me this year. This won't be in my top ten personally. But you know what? If you really dug it. Um, there was some incredible special effects that were done. There was some really some good twists and turns, though you kind of had an idea of what was going on throughout the movie. Um, there was nothing that made me be like, "Oh my god, no way!" Right. No, right? I think I think the final like that reveal at the beginning of the third act made me go, "Oh well, this was somewhere else." <laughs> no, see, I suspected that. Oh, okay. See, I, I did. I didn't that. suspect the full thing, but I thought it was going to be more of a psychological thing. Ah, uh, gotcha. Right. So I kind of thought that that was the route they were going to go down. Obviously, not the full route that I that I assumed it would be. 
Um, you, know, you know, it made sense to the beginning clip that they show. And, you know, James Wan is, makes entertaining movies. This isn't entertaining enough. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you know, nowhere near me for one of my favorite films, but I'm not going to shit on it either. I don't think it deserves to be shit on. There's way worse movies. I think old was way worse than this. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, right. So yeah, anyway, just, if you're in, sorry, go ahead. I'll just say, yeah, I just got to give respect to it again for like them actually releasing this in theaters. Cause this is not your typical horror film for theaters. No. So it is available in theaters, HBO max. Um, I don't know where else. I don't think, yeah, I think that's the only places right now. So the only two places to watch it, I would say HBO max is appropriate to watch this. Movie yeah. On. I wouldn't go to theater to see it. No, personally it wouldn't be something I would do, but Hey, you know what you do you at the end of the day. So exactly. the other movie that we both watched, I think, no, you haven't seen it yet. Have yes, you? I, have I, you? I watched it before you did. Oh, right. Okay. Do you want to talk about it then? Sure. Uh, this one is Chompy and the Girls. A very silly title, but a very heartfelt, like charming film as well with a very special message that Heather actually picked up on when she watched it. Um, but it's basically about this uh, a strange mother or a strange daughter and father who uh, the dad never knew he had a daughter. And she comes into his life at like a very awkward time. And they meet up to try to reconnect when all of a sudden they see a man across the street swallowing a little girl whole. And well, it goes weird from weirder and weirder from there. It is definitely like a horror comedy drama, I would want to say, and maybe a bit of sci fi. Yeah. Um, but I found this film to be just absolutely, like I said earlier, heartwarming and charming. Like this was like a very surprise view uh, watch for me. Like, cause I just kind of seen it. I'm going, this sounds like it could be ridiculous. I'll watch it. And like, holy crap. Like I'm very impressed. The acting was all around awesome from everybody. Hey Dave, um, see, this is an example of something not passing a cover test. That's a good film. Yes. Agreed. Like <laughs> Dave Z watch this. Like you may have a lot of respect for this. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I thought everybody in this film did great. It was funny. It, it was very heartwarming, like very charming film. The special effects are hokey and cheesy, but that's what they're supposed to be in this film. So it yeah. totally fits the world it's in. And like, they're decent for the mo movie. I thought they were fine, honestly. Well, I'll just say Chompy with the mouth just looked really ridiculous. But it I loved it. Supposed to. I told I, I loved it, but it looked ridiculous. <laughs> it was supposed to. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it was practical. Yeah, I'll say everything about that was practical. Right. And but yeah, not, I just thought this was a really well done film. And I was I'll let you talk about the message since you were the one that picked up on that. Yeah, this film's about addiction um, and overcoming addiction and how it and how it swallows you and, and how you have to fight to get out of it and how you bring others down with you and how addiction can spread. This movie had some very deep meaning behind it. Um, the acting is so good. Like everyone in this movie pulled off incredible acting chops. Um, Jackson in particular, Christy St. John, I hope to see her in more shit. Yeah. She is a excellent actress. Um, Chompy was in Suspiria. He's been in a bunch of other films. The gentleman that played Chompy, um, the gentleman that played Sam's only been in a handful of films too. Another good actor. There were some really good people that could have been put in malignant or old and would have done a much better fucking job. Um, Agreed. And I got to give credit to uh, the main girl's uh, best friend they meet at the party. Like and how like he ends up uh, saving that one girl from being date raped and how he does it. Oh, yeah, that's pretty funny. Yeah, like, I, was, I was like, you know what? I love this character for doing that. He like he put himself through hell for it, but he did it. Like and it I, loved was, I loved him for that. Yeah, it was it was really it was really cool. Um, yeah, overall, great film. Very entertaining strongly recommend it it's available yeah. on itunes google voodoo youtube and youtube and hoopla, if, hoopla. Uh, and it is a 89 minute runtime so it doesn't overstay its welcome yeah this is worth any rental you pay for i think like especially it's like an indie film so support those indie films and this one is just really good and a very nice surprise excellent yeah so for older films, we I watched The Uncanny, which was recommended to me from Scott a long time ago, uh, 1977. And it's really cute. I think it's, who is it put, is it Peter Cushing? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. And the cat stories are great. I love that. Oh, I love it. And there's so many cats. It reminded me of Scott's life. Um, <laughs> but yeah, if you're looking for a short little fun anthology uh, from 1977, and you did cats uh, and the whole mythology behind cats, I 
really enjoyed this film. Basically, it made the cat look like it's way smarter than the rest of us. And I mean, uh, Donald Pleasant's in this one. Yes. Um, he. This is what I'm talking about. Donald Pleasant being in these other roles. And he he's great, man. Like the short that he's in is he's fucking great. Oh, absolutely. It. it was so good. So yeah, I if you have if you like anthologies and for some reason you've skipped over this bad boy, please check it out. Yeah, it's one of my favorite anthologies that I watched and prepped for our top five anthology because it was just like nice. a nice surprise. Nice. Um, and I actually got an older film for once. Uh, and I decided to uh check out one of the Vincent Price films I have not watched yet, and I'm ashamed to admit that I haven't seen it yet, but the abominable Dr. Fives from 1971, uh, where Vincent Price plays Dr. Fives, who is a uh, husband who is basically getting uh, revenge one by one on all the doctors and surgeons and people who end up not being able to save his wife after she died or save his wife when she went to the hospital and she died, like died shortly after. So he's a man that's distraught and just wants revenge for him. And he ends up being in an accident, getting horrifically scarred. So he wears like this uh, mask over his face. And that is one thing I love about this film is you'll see a Vincent Price face like and he's talking, but his lips aren't moving. But you can see like his jaw, like he's actually making his jaw move. Like you can see like in the cheekbones, like him talking, but he's not actually speaking out loud. Like you just hear like it's almost like he's thinking it. And you come to find out that's a wax mask he put over his burned face. So like, yeah, that's why he's not talking because the masks don't actually have open a mouth. But this is a just great, fun little revenge tale. Like it um, definitely the his movie Theater of Blood later on uh, definitely took inspirations with this, with the distraught actor that gets revenge on the critics. Like it's definitely along those lines, except for Theater of Blood's more having fun with it. But yeah, this is a very good, serious revenge film that I highly recommend, especially if you are a fan of Vincent Price like I am or just, you know, just a general fan. And like, I recommend this one. It's so good. Awesome. It's definitely one of his better films. Awesome. Well, thanks for bringing it to the table, Scotty. Absolutely. Um, And in terms of what we've been listening to, I I have one podcast on here, but I don't want to talk about that one. I want to talk about um, one that's called Disappearance and it's run on the podcast network. And this podcast talks about people that have disappeared and it's, it's very powerful. Um, It brings attention to missing person cases that have never been solved and attempts to spread the word about um, these cases. And, you know, the hour, the episodes are about 45 minutes to 50 minutes in length. The woman that runs it, um, she lost her sister. Um, her sister disappeared and was dis- mm. and was missing for over 20 years before she got an answer using social media to what happened to her. Oh, wow. So it's very powerful. And I just, I heard a story and I really wanted to give a shout out to this. On my True North podcast I listened to, they talked about a young woman named Tegan Coots. Um, Tegan was abducted by her grandparents and taken to Turkey against the wishes of her parents. Um, actually, her mother's passed away. Um, the maternal grand grandparents forged foreign documents and created a passport for Tegan against the court's orders, uh, kidnapped her and took her to Turkey and her father is fighting to get her back. So the reason why I'm sharing this is because I know we have listeners around the world. And as of right now, Canada and Turkey do not have an agreement where they can work with the Turkish, I'm sorry, they've moved to, um, it's not Canada and Turkey. That's where they landed was Turkey, but we don't have an agreement where we can bring Tegan home. Um, she is there illegally. These The grandparents do not have custody. So if you know anyone named Tegan Coots and you are on the other side of the world, please contact Interpool or your local authorities if you can um, to try to bring Tegan home. They're trying to share awareness for her. And unfortunately, the foreign affairs in Canada can do nothing. And the other country can do nothing. And this isn't right. So uh, I know we don't usually share this stuff on this podcast, but I heard this story this week and this just happened on July 8th of 2021. So this is fresh. This has only happened two months ago. So there is a chance that, you know, Tegan can come home. Her father has taken a leave of absence from his job and is working around the clock to try to follow leads. So if you know, if you're on the other side of the world and you know someone named Tegan Coots, then 
please, please, please do the right thing and contact either Interpol or your local authorities to provide some tips. And um, check out the Disappearing Podcast on Parcast, our Disappearance Podcast on Parcast Network. Um, it's very informational. It's very interesting to hear about the people that are missing. And I like to listen because just just in case, you never know who you run into. You never know who you're going to talk to. And if right. I can make a difference, then that's meaningful. Yeah, I that is, wow. I'm kind of speechless. Mm. Yeah, I never told Scott I was going to do that. I kind of decided to because um, the podcast people said, if you can just spread the word. So I'm spreading the word. So yeah, I'll say we got the we got the voice to do it. So right. So you know we don't usually do that, and we won't always do that again in the future. But this was a special case, and you know if you happen to know who this young woman is or are aware of the situation, and you have information, please contact local authorities or or Interpol or the RCMP if you feel more comfortable contacting them, uh, which is the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Canada. And you can provide some tips anonymously and and try to bring Tegan home. Yes, please do. All right, so uh, I'm going to talk about a show that I've already brought up once before, but it's just because uh, it's a friend of mine, uh, Santos Ellen Jr., also known as the Black Saint. Uh, I had gotten my uh, notification that he had passed away about four or so years ago now, and so it just kind of put me in my emotions because he was uh, like he was kind of like a close friend like I have with some of the other podcasts, not like as close as you and I are, obviously, or you and mm-hmm. Brandon are, but like, you know, I like where it's like, I know enough about him. He knows enough about me. We talked here and there and like, you know, it, we built a relationship. And so when I heard that news, it like that he would passed away, it freaking devastated me. And so when I seen the anniversary was coming up of his passing, I went and found some of his older episodes on horror news radio because they're still going on. Like they just have new hosts now as well. But I went back to their older episodes and got to listen to some of his uh, him, some of his rants because he was a cantankerous old coot that loved to just like bash on some of the newer films. But like for like he had his reasonings that actually made sense. And it was always funny to hear him get fired up. So it just kind of kind of warmed my heart and just wanted just kind of took me down uh, memory lane with him. Um, but yeah, I even. I even went as far as to pretty much making myself cry because I went to the episode after he had passed where they did a tribute to him and it was just clips of Santos Ellen Jr. or Black Saint and all the hosts' uh, stories about him and things like that. And I was just bawling my eyes out listening to it. At the same time, it was just like something I wanted to do just in his honor, just to, watch, just to listen to those. And his all-time favorite movie is The Manitou. So I'm going to try and watch that sometime tonight in his honor and make a glass of whiskey sour because that was his favorite drink. But oh, that's very sweet, Scott. Rest in peace, Santos, Black Saint. Love you, buddy. You have definitely left an impression on me and I will never forget you. Absolutely. And thanks for paving the road. We've lost a couple of podcasters this year. And um, even though Santo wasn't this year, um, it's still you, you build these relationships with people that you never meet in person. Yeah. And it's very special. And, you know, let's continue to support each other and each other's podcasts and continue to grow. So we're going to be back in just one moment after a message from one of our Legion podcast friends. So after these messages, we'll be right back. Cha-cha. Are you sick of the same old stale podcast? Well, then join Vanessa and Darren as they dissect movies of all kinds. The two lifelong cinema lovers bring their favorites, curiosities, and first-time watches to the operating table and inject them with a healthy dose of snark. Then there's the waiting room, where they examine books and short stories. So just look for them on Apple Podcasts and where fine podcasts are available. They're part of the Legion Podcast Network. Follow them on Twitter at VD Clinic Pod. Join them on Facebook at facebook.com slash groups slash VD Clinic Pod. Or email them at VD Clinic Pod at gmail.com. They're ready to cure what ails you. (laughs) And still, they just might be a little contagious. Welcome back. Um, Today, we're going to be talking about wedding horror. 
and how wedding horror horror comes together in movies. Uh, as of last night, I was actually at a wedding. I was lucky enough to receive a last minute invite to a wedding and they had a guest cancel and it's the first wedding I've been to in the past three years and I had a great time. Uh, the bride and groom were amazing. The bride looked beautiful. The groom looked handsome. They wrote their own wedding bell, wedding vows. They got married on the top of a hotel roof, which was beautifully decked out with lights and and everything like that. And it was it was so much fun. I I personally really like weddings. Um, maybe not so much the marriage part, but I do definitely like weddings. Um, and this was just an absolute awesome circumstance. So it's really cool that we should be talking talking about this today. Uh, so weddings are obviously fairly common. I think most of us have been involved with a wedding at some point or another. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to just pull from an article that I'm not going to go over all of them, but there's a whole bunch of common wedding traditions. And, you know, this wedding had no, had, was no expectation. Like they also, no exception. They also had traditions that were done as well too, right? So they also had bridesmaids. Uh, She had three beautiful bridesmaids that were tending to her. And if you've ever wondered why bridesmaids are often asked to wear the same matching dresses to support the bride during the wedding, it wasn't always to ensure that the bride stood out while her besties donned tacky grounds, quite the opposite. As bridesmaids originally wore similar dresses to the bride to confuse her exes and outsmart evil spirits. That way, the evil spirits wouldn't know which woman in the group was getting married. As far as bridemaid duties, in early Roman times, bridemaids would line up to form somewhat of a protective shield while walking the bride to the groom's village. The group of women were similarly dressed with expected to intervene if any vengeful paramourners tried to hurt the bride or steal her dowry. Aren't you glad today that you're only responsible for smiling while carrying a bouquet? (laughs) Wow. Right? So the bridesmaids did an excellent job of protecting any unwanted suitors yesterday. There was nobody there. (laughs) Probably my favorite part of the wedding is the wedding cake. So the origins of the wedding cake. It was common for grooms to take a, a bite of bread at the wedding crumbling the rest over the bride's head for good luck. Guests would scramble around her feet to pick up the crumbs in order to absorb some of that good luck. Later, the tradition evolved into the bride pushing pieces of her wedding cake through her ring to the guest. Those in attendance would take the cake home to place under their pillows for, again, good luck. It's a great thing today. You can just enjoy a slice or two at the wedding without having to pick up crumbs off the floor. And they had some beautiful wedding cakes last night. It was a very traditional wedding. Um, I got to say, it was very, very traditional. I was saying, so, I, I do love the traditional wedding. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. We really, you know, I really enjoyed it. And it was just so fitting that I went to that before we had this today. I know, that's, well, when you talked about the whole, like, can we push the recording back because I got invited to a wedding? And I was just like, absolutely. That makes perfect sense for our episode. So we'll give you a story to tell. <laughs> absolutely, right? So we'll finish off with one last one, which is the origins of the best man. So obviously runaway brides have been around for quite some time because the man's because the man best man's former duty was to make sure the bride didn't escape during the ceremony. Sometimes he was even asked to kidnap her. Yes, kidnap her. When wow. the parents didn't approve of the marriage, the best man was tasked with ensuring the groom was able to take her away regardless of how her father wow. felt. Also, oh, and the best man just wasn't picked because he was the groom's best friend or brother. No, the term best was added to the title because that was had to be the strongest and most capable of the <laughs> lot when it came to using a sword or a weapon to fight off an enemy or rival attackers during ceremonies. And you thought the job of remembering to bring the wedding bands was hard, which this best man did. He actually had both of the rings last night. Oh, nice. And we'll do one more. We'll do the white wedding dress because that's pretty relevant, I think. Yeah. Some of the key things of weddings. So white is often associated with purity, which is why it is thought of as a traditional color for virgin brides. But did you know that before the mid 1800s, brides wore red? They didn't start wearing white until around 1840 when Queen Victoria was married to Prince Albert. Victoria went against the grain and opted for a white lace dress, a color at the time represented with wealth as opposed to purity. Clearly, the trend caught on as many brides today still wear the classic white gown, though a lot of women will wear red. And depending on your culture, um, there's lots of different, you know, outfits and stuff that someone would wear to their wedding. So I think that's really cool. So this was just a little article that was found in Southern Living. We'll include the link to it if you want to go through the other traditions 
um, that came from weddings, but obviously weddings have become a major, major part of our society and of our history. So what we've done this time with our movie list is we put them in order, not of years, but as of how the events would go out. So we have pre-wedding, the prep for the wedding, the day of the wedding, and then after the wedding. So I'll let Scotty Scotty begin with the first one. All right. So the first one we're going to be talking about is, uh, actually, let's say this right now. There are going to be spoilers for two of the films that came out this year, Slash Lorette Party and The Stylist. So if you have not seen these, either go back and watch the films or skip ahead. But uh, I will try to leave. I will try to timestamp when we talk about these films so you guys know where they are in the show notes. Um, but the first film we are going to be talking about is Slash Lorette Party, which was released March 20th of 2021. An anxious young woman is taken by her friends to a remote cabin in the woods to celebrate her bachelorette party. The fun and games are cut short when an uninvited guest begins killing off the wedding party one by one. Um, this one is definitely uh, the one we were talking about earlier in our what we've been watching segment where it's kind of a over the top with some of the characters because this woman is getting married to the most toxic masculinity type dude ever who is just like damn near abusive or oh, yeah, at least horrible. he's verbally verbally abusive for sure oh yeah um, and he's a downright piece of shit um and you can tell she has like the pre-wedding uh fears and stuff like that so she's talking to her therapist about this and then she gets home and is going to be breaking up with him. But then her bride's uh, maid of honor and her bridesmaids show up to steal her away for a, I guess, what was they call it? A stag party where it was the bachelorette and bachelor party together. Yeah, in one house. this just sounds like the dumbest idea I've ever heard. Yes. Right. Like they're getting strippers for the men and male strippers. And for then women. like she's watching her husband get a lap dance. Like it's so ridiculous. But anyway, it was fun. It was fun. Yeah. So yeah, like she's in the middle of writing this letter to break up with him. And then all of a sudden just getting pulled away to do the, uh, to do this bachelorette party. And like, she's just so strung out and worried and this and that everything happens. And then of course the, they get to the cabin, which, uh, yep, this definitely, this maid of honor definitely takes her duties very very seriously well i liked her because she was the over the top maid of honor like in every and i could even see last night in the bridesmaids the one that took it really seriously and the one that was there for a good time yes and they even told a story about them getting kicked out of party city because something that had to do with dick balloons and you could know the one that got them kicked out of party city and the one that was stressed out about it because she was the one that told the story. <laughs> and it is totally like they got the stereotypes right down. Like I was listening to these awesome speeches last night and thinking about Sasha Rett because um, this, this bride and her groom, I obviously know them. I work with them. This is why I got the last minute um, invite and I consider ourselves pretty good friends. I hung out with them this summer and stuff. And uh, they had their bachelor and bachelorette party the same weekend, but different locations. Right. So that he makes went to sense. Niagara Falls. She went to a place called Blue Mountain. Um, and, but yeah, you could totally see like in this movie, the stereotypes. I'm like, yep, there's always that. There's always the bridesmaid that takes it seriously. The bridesmaids that want to just have a fucking good time, which was the one girl, the one that doesn't think she should be getting married. The caddy one, like they put all the stereotypes in this movie perfectly. Yep, and even the same for the uh, groomsman. Yes, and the uh, best man, like, and uh, how he's the best man's taking it serious, but also not as serious as the uh, maid of honor is. Like, yeah, he's like, yep, he's like, you know, I'm here to support my friend. He's a piece of crap, but it's his wedding. He asked me to be his best man. I'm going to be there for him. Um, but then, like, the other ones are there just to party and try to hook up with the uh, bridesmaids and all this other stuff like it definitely has the whole uh because in this one we're talking like the bachelor party for this episode or for this movie and they definitely uh tackle the bachelor bachelorette party aspect really well besides the whole combining them two together in one house which i'm sure some people would do i just don't know how like that guy wants to bang her friend and then he's banging her behind his her friend's back like he was a typical asshole groom right like right. he was totally like the piece of shit that's you know stepping out on his girl with her best friend and her best friend is or not one of her best friends I guess just the girl that she knows like it's just so it's so stereotypical but it's so much fun yeah. um and the therapist comes in for some razzle dazzle we won't go into that part because that really has nothing to do with the wedding it's more of the setup of the bachelorette um them drinking trying to have a good time 
Um, the characters that are tied in, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you look at it from just a wedding party, getting together, getting drunk, being like, this is our last weekend. Woo! Like it was totally all that in a fucking bag of chips. Like yeah. it reminded me of my bachelorette where I went pole dancing because I got my girls pole dancing lessons. I paid for that. So we all <laughs> went and did that. And then we went back to my place, ordered food and decorated our own martini glasses. And then we went out to a club and uh, that sounds like your type of bachelor. It was right <laughs> totally my type of bachelor party. Mine um, was uh, getting my bachelor party was going to my uh, brother's house because my brother was my best man. And he set up this big old like party in his uh, in his mom's backyard, which is my like technically would have been my like stepmom, basically. Um, and we were just sitting out back eating lots of food and booze galore and tons and tons of weed. All my best friends were there. And Scott was hammered by 9, 30, 10 o'clock, like you seen me drunk and slurring my words. I was on when I came to visit you. Yeah. I was beyond that by nine, 10 o'clock at night because I was taking shots of tequila. I was just like, it was liquor, liquor, liquor. There was no beer. And yeah, I was a mess and I blacked out and apparently had to get carried into a bedroom. I woke up the next day, had no idea where I was because I was just like, oh man, some- no strippers. <laughs> No strippers. My brother wasn't uh, able to afford that. Oh, that's fair. Yeah, I guess it. Really I didn't. I didn't expect him to. And I didn't. I don't. And I don't want. Like I'm getting married. I don't want strippers being involved in my bachelor party. No, oh, you're so polite. I get you strippers now if you got married again. If you had a bachelor party <laughs> now. Oh, well, man. you would be my best man as well. <laughs> oh, fuck, dude, it'd be dangerous. <laughs> Oh, oh. Be <laughs> probably yeah anyway we'll leave off how that would go because it would it would be a time um yeah oh man anyway back to this movie not thinking about how we're gonna one day throw scotty a bachelor party that's gonna be <laughs> fucking epic um but yeah i i do think this represents the whole bachelorette really really well i thought the bride did a good job of showing her anxiety you know, overall, it's actually a really good indie film. Some parts of it are silly, but it does represent uh, it does represent the whole bachelorette bachelor party. So let's once you get past that, where do you end up? You end up with the preparation for the wedding, including and the hairstylist from hell. Yeah, I was gonna say, including getting your hair did by a stylist. <laughs> so the film we're talking about is The Stylist, which was released. March 1st on 2021, a lonely hairdresser slowly descends into madness and destroys everything around her. Wow, that is a very uh, nondescript uh, uh, synopsis there. But uh, basically, this yeah, the story does revolve around this hairstylist who has a client who has been who basically begs her to do her hair for the wedding because the stylist doesn't normally do weddings for some reason or another. I forget what, I forget if there was a reason ever given, but she normally just turned. Probably because of the stress, I think, which is fair because it is extremely stressful to do wedding hair. If you ever go to a salon, um, male or female, and you're getting your hair done and it's, you know, wedding season and you ask them how, you know, it's going, they'll be like a lot of weddings is always something they'll say because it's a lot of fucking work. You're up early. It's a Saturday. Typically you're doing hair and makeup. Sometimes you have a makeup artist that comes in and brides want their hair to be perfect. It, you know, there's a lot of bridezillas, right? Well, and in all fairness, weddings are very expensive and it's a mm-hmm. lot of work and energy And the wedding industry is a money-making fucking machine oh yeah you want a sample of capitalism fucking wedding industry is that um and you know there's a lot of pressure for everything to be right so i can understand why stylists would turn down weddings because it is a lot of work okay yeah that makes a lot of sense then right. um because yeah obviously you know me with my hair i totally went to a stylist mm-hmm. for sure. <laughs> but uh yeah, like so she ends up accepting and uh, bringing this client in who she's done her hair before multiple times. So, like, they have each other's cell phone numbers and are messaging each other back and forth. And uh, basically, this woman, uh, the stylist, becomes, I would say, obsessed with uh, the, her client. And uh, the way I took this film is she was going to this, like, going through all this and wanting to become her and live her life. Because um, the stylist, well, we'll give a little backstory, but the stylist does, like, pretty much kills certain people that she doesn't like or that she wants to be but and then scalps them and keeps their hair and will secretly wear that in her like basement and pretend to be that person saying some of the things they said to her in confidence while she was cutting their hair and styling it 
So she basically likes to take on different personas by putting on these people's hair. Um, but yeah, she becomes obsessed with this one and like she gets in, like, invited to the bachelor at party at the uh, bar and they get nice and drunk and she's all awkward there. And then it's going through the whole process of like, you know, meeting up and trying to plan when to do the hair hairstyling, when she should show up to the church to do it for like to make sure it's all said and done and touched up and do the makeup. And it just kind of is an escalation of madness with this stylist because she becomes Well, so and we're not obsessed. talking about how she is also killing people throughout this period of time, yeah. too. So she's obsessed with taking people's hair because she wants to take their identity. Yeah, I saw I talking about that earlier. Oh, did you? Okay, yeah. sorry. I didn't hear you say that. Um, probably because I'm super tired um, from a <laughs> wedding last night. So I, I think that what's interesting about this is the stylist takes a step forward into the bride's life that you don't usually see yes you don't usually see that happening but i did like the scene at the church where she shows up and she does the little girl's hair and the first time i saw this movie that made me really anxious Mm -hmm. i was really worried something was going to happen to the little girls spoiler it doesn't um but the ending of this film is just creepy as fuck um yes i think it's a very subtle horror film but i think her sadness and her depression is i think amplified by being on the outside of this wedding as a stylist and you kind of get invited to this stuff but you're also still a stranger and i think it really calculated that loneliness combined with society's expectations of preparation for a wedding and how you can be on the outside invited in but not fully in Wow, that actually, yeah, that's a great way of explaining it. Because, yeah, she does, like, because she feels like she, you know, she's getting invited to all these things. So it makes her feel like she's part of the group. But then when she gets there, she does not feel like part of the group. Well, and she has that conversation The you know, people share things with their hairstylists throughout this. And that happens yeah. with strangers and other people. And it's true. I talk to my hairstylist, too. Like, women, if you gen- if you identify as a woman and you've been socialized to talk, um, sometimes that's a very common, you know, stereotype or, or a behavior that you engage in. And I think this movie amplified it really, really well. Yeah. But there was actually one thing said in the very beginning scene that like totally makes sense. But the woman who was, uh, the client she was working on that she kills in the beginning, she was like, I, I feel confident in telling you these things. Cause I know I'll never see you again. So I can tell you these things about me that no one else knows. It's true. And, you know, it really, yeah, I I think this movie really, as we said already, represented the prep of going into a wedding situation. It was really, really well done. Yeah, but it Um, goes all the way up to the wedding, which is really cool. Yeah, yeah. And the ending scene is just very haunting to me. I can't imagine being the groom in that situation. Yeah, Um, yeah. Or the or the mother in the in the audience. Oh, yeah. Like traumatic, traumatizing, traumatizing. And I love how the little girl's smiling because she just thinks she looks so pretty. Right. Um, That's (laughs) probably my favorite part. So I know this is one of your movies that is near and dear to your heart. So let's talk about after the wedding and the night of. All right. So, you know, let's uh, discuss Ready or Not, released July 27th, 2019. After the wedding ceremony of a young woman, her new in-laws force her to participate in a seemingly innocent game. Things soon turn bloody and sinister, revealing the sick rituals of the family. So this film is literally the starts off at the wedding and then continues into the night of and or into the early morning. But uh, yeah, instead of, like so when the, the couple gets married, they go back to their bedroom and she's thinking, you know, all right, nighttime, we're going to get a good chance to have our alone time together. And they're going to fuck. Consummate That's the marriage. trying to yep. say. <laughs> well, in, well, in wedding terms, consummate the marriage. Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but then uh, they get called down because this. Uh, the family that she's married into is very, very rich, and they are basically uh, rich from board games and, well, something else. <laughs> How do you get rich from fucking board games? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, there's whoever owns Hasbro probably makes a shit ton. Of I, I guess you're right. I, <laughs> you just don't think about it, but made off my money that's a little made. But uh, yeah, so she they they invite her down and they say this is a family tradition since we are entrepreneurs in the gaming world. Uh, we have our uh, in-law that just got married into our family play a game with us at midnight uh, of the day of their wedding. So we're going to have you basically roll the dice with this like randomized thing. 
and whatever game it comes up with, you play. And they and some of the people that have been married into the family talk about, oh yeah, they, I had to play backgammon, I had to play checkers, and this and that. Like stupid, but let's just go, you know, just go along with it. Well, she ends up pulling the card hide and seek, which apparently is the one in a thousand unlucky chance. Because when you pull that card, you are playing hide and seek. And once you are found, you are dead. Basically, you are being hunted by the family. And there is a reason behind it, but I won't need to get into that right now because it's just focusing on the wedding, the bachelor or the wedding, the in-laws and just kind of the night of. And so, yeah, the whole chaos of this ensues and you just kind of get to know all the in-laws of this family and also puts into question on you don't really know who you married uh, and much about his family. So like the in-laws are very heartwarming, but also a bit sadistic. And then you have the sister who's the drug addict and the brother who's the alcoholic and they're the people they married like are totally about this and all about the money so they will do what they have to to hunt her down and kill her because they want to stay rich but it definitely shows like yeah this story is like yep you may not know exactly who you are marrying at the time agreed because yeah it shows the even the husband like all of a sudden kind of has a turn towards the end i think this movie though if we look at if we look at like the wedding night right i think it does represent the whole you're anxious around your in-laws you want to get to know them you want to be accepted you know they think she's a gold digger or she thinks they think she's a gold digger that just married into the family um and (laughs) I do really dig the fact that she runs around in her wedding gown the entire night and it yes. gets ripped and destroyed. And, you know, you hear a little bit about her background that she came from a really impoverished family. She was like, well, not impoverished. She was adopted and fostered home. And, you know, she really wants to have a family to call her own, which is why she pushed her boyfriend to want to get married. And I think that the game, obviously, and the hide and go seek part takes up majority of the film. But what a way to spend your wedding night. And I think it yeah. does play into... On your wedding, you don't know what's going to occur. Like I was at this wedding last night and like the last couple of weekends have been hot and been beautiful. And as their ceremony is about to begin, a fucking rainstorm comes in and Mm. they are stuck dealing with this hurricane type rain. And we're waiting for it to clear up so they can go on the rooftop and get married. And they eventually do. And they have a couple of minutes and then it clears up enough that they can get pictures outside, but it's cold. So they're trying to like, you know, make the best of the situation. And that's so minor, right? Like that's something that's just small fish. But, you know, you look at this situation with Samara leaving, who does an excellent job in this role. Oh, she And does. her wedding ended up being nothing like she thought it was going to be. And of course you have the turn of characters where you're wondering, do these people, are they actually going to implode or die? And, you know, they talk about how families have died in a house fire. And there's a lot of great comedy throughout this film. Like, there's Oh, it is freaking hilarious. That happens. The sister that's doing drugs the entire time, not knowing how to use the crossbow. Accidentally it's, killing people. <laughs> accidentally killing people. Like, it's a really great, like, you never know what the fuck's going to happen on your wedding night. You get to the e- morning where everyone implodes because they managed not to kill her. And the police show up and they're like, what happened? And she just says in-laws. Yes. And <laughs> I, I think that that just sums up you know, you're going into this family, you're right, you don't know what you're marrying into, you don't know what your wedding night's going to be. And this movie is just a lot of fun for people who have maybe have a different view on marriage. And I think that it's really, really well done for that reason. I completely agree. Yeah, like uh, this and the whole like, you're not knowing what's going to happen during your wedding. Uh, Like that kind of reminds me of my wedding day, we decided to have our ours was an outdoor wedding in our backyard. And it literally was the hardest longest rain that i have ever experienced in my life that happened that day so our backyard was nothing but pure mud and that's where we were is our backyard we thankfully had tents up so we were able to get married under the tent but no one could barely hear uh, the mayor that was marrying us because he had a the microphone but it was raining so hard it was drowning out his voice like it was like a complete disaster with mother nature, but it still ended up being a lot of fun. But it's it's like, yeah, like when it comes to weddings, you don't know what's going to happen, especially if you do an outside wedding. It's so true. Right. So and you don't know if you marry into a crazy family that makes money off of board games. Right. And have a um, deal with the devil. <laughs> right. But very, very fun film. People haven't checked it out yet. If even if you you know think weddings are the bee's knees. 
Um, this is still a very fun mo- movie that talks about what could happen the night of the wedding. Yes. And let's get to the favorite part that most people look forward to. All right. So the final piece to this wedding themed episode is the movie Honeymoon, which was released September 19th in 2014. A honeymooning bride goes sleepwalking into the woods surrounded by a secluded cabin. When she returns, she looks the same, but something about her is frighteningly different. Um, this is this is something I watched last year for the first time. And when I seen this, I was like, oh, this would be a good pairing with Ready or Not. And then I was just waiting for the right type of movies to come along to make this episode happen. Nice. And then, yep, Slash Lorette Party and the stylist came out. And I'm going, perfect. We got the movies we need for this. But, uh, yep, this is definitely a very uh, relationship-based one. Out of all these here, this is the one that, you know, totally screams me because of, like, the whole relationship and being married. You see them, like, excitedly driving. Driving up like they cross the Canadian border because this all happens in Canada, at least from the movie. I'm not you said it was partly filmed in Canada, at least. Yeah, I think so. It was it's hard to identify where it was exactly filmed, but I love how their love is reflected. Like you see their little wedding video of them being yes. talking about how they met and their first date. And you know, like people have videos, like there was videos galore last night at this wedding. It's a big deal to have videos and pictures. And I did like how they kind of showed them watching that fresh off of their their wedding at their honeymoon and like you can tell how excited they are like you're my husband you're my wife like it's just you're on that high yep. of you know reality hasn't hit to you about what committing to someone forever means um yet and i'm not saying that's a bad thing i'm just saying that you know it's the honeymoon stage it's the reason why they call it the honeymoon stage is exactly everything is wonderful and you're just on a high of the commitment and i think this movie does reflect that really well Yes, it really does. And like, especially you can see when their excitement, when they pull up to the cabin that they're going to stay in and Mm -hmm. it's her family cabin. So she's showing them around all excitedly like, oh, here's this and here's this. And they're like making out and she's taking clothes off and leading them to the bedroom at the same time. Just like, yep, we're going to get to sex. Just got to show you around the house first. And like, yeah. But like you see them just like truly happy together. And like, you know, that like you said, that total honeymoon stage. Yeah. And then like, they even have a conversation about babies. Yes. And it's right? awkward because it's like it's awkward. Yep. Because of the honeymoon stage. You're not really thinking about that right away. Right. Absolutely. And I think what's interesting is when she changes, I almost felt like this sped up where you have problems in a relationship. Yes. Like it was so quick. They, they run into an ex friend of hers. She thinks he's acting super weird. Um, and then the ne- he finds her outside his, her husband finds her outside the next day, sleeping, sleepwalking. And she starts to change. She says she made coffee, but she didn't grind the coffee beans. Says she's making French toast, but she didn't put the bread in the batter. I remember ta- you talking about this movie on how she, you know, says in the mirror, reminding herself of things when her birthday is, mm-hmm. who her husband is. And she even screws up little words like it's in the box. I mean, the, the suitcase. The hamper. Oh, yeah, the suitcase. Yeah. Right. And it's almost like dementia or it's almost like someone is changing and hiding something and you don't know what. So it was really, to me, it almost was like a progression of their marriage going from good to bad in hours. Yeah. Like just sped up what happens to a lot of people's relationships, to be honest with you. Right. Cause I was going to say, cause yeah, like uh, when they meet up and see her uh, like friend at that other place, Like that's when he's starting to get suspicions because they're both kind of acting a bit weird towards each other. Mm -hmm. And he's starting to get suspicions that there is something else going on. And then, yeah, like he starts he starts feeling like she's sneaking off at night and cheating on him because he ends up going out in the woods later and finds her nightgown that she doesn't remember, like that she says she has in the laundry basket. Um, he finds it out in the woods where it's ripped and torn. And so he's thinking she was meeting him, meeting that guy out in the woods late at night and having sex and cheating on him, basically causing distrust when there's something much more sinister going on. Oh, much Um, more sinister. Yeah. But yeah, it's, you totally nailed it. It shows like the happiness of like a newfound wedding and like the bliss that you're on. And then like, just kind of like the like troubles that can be in marriage. The sharp decline, the sharp decline of you changing as a person and the other person not understanding your changes or what's going on. And even her avoiding sex with him and, you know, because something's wrong with her and, you know, her slight decline and then her sabotage in their relationship at the end 
by harming him because she believes he's protecting her. She believes he's she's protecting him. Yes. Right. Which is what happens in a lot of relationships. They we engage in behaviors that we think is protective, but it's actually more harmful and sometimes deadly. And I thought that this movie was a very, very good play on the emotions that come with the high of a wedding and then diving into the struggles that come after a marriage with using a Lovecraftian element to it um i don't love lovecraft but this is where i enjoyed it i thought it was done well and i thought the acting between these two individuals wow they made the fucking movie um they were phenomenal they were very very good they worked with the dialogue well and the directing was awesome in this film as well too yeah because rose leslie doing the lines that she did like you were saying where she was just screwing up even the littlest words and then they catch it like she was slipping i love that like it's just subtle acting but the way she does it and catches it and like kind of rolls with it i'm going I, that's just incredible it's like yeah well, like his reaction saying, to it like yeah. he was great like they made that movie if it had been two shittier people that would have never been a decent film no um but yeah these three movies do definitely pull into each other um you know the horror of weddings and marriage and prep and and anxiety towards wedding towards getting married uh luckily i saw none of that last night at the wedding i was at it was one of the nicest weddings i've been to i'm I'm, sure leading up to it there was the stress oh i'm sure there was of course there is right but they you know i've been to a lot of weddings i'm sure you have too scott I don't know. Well, maybe you haven't. I don't know. Have you? Yeah, I have. Okay. Um, This was one where you could tell they were really happy. And and they really seemed to have a good vibe. Uh, Anyone that can include the NFL draft as part of their vows and vowing to love each other, even when their teams suck, and that (laughs) they would save the cats first in a house fire are people who really do get each other's sense of humor. And um it was beautiful and you know hopefully their marriage will have ups and downs like every relationship does Mm -hmm. and they brought that up already in their vows that you know it's not going to be easy but i'm in it and i think that's real yeah because love is hard love is hard relationships are hard yeah friendships are hard there's days where i want to fucking wring scott's neck (laughs) you know and and that and there's days i have close girlfriends that i want to wring their neck it's not just my romantic relationships it's every relationship every relationship has its challenges right but you have to try to look at it with you know is it worth maintaining and you know what sometimes they're not just so we're clear here sometimes they're not and that's okay Yep. Some um, of that you just got to get to that point where you realize that and do like just don't stay with it. Right. Know your worth. Yes. Um. And I think that's really important. But I think these movies do a great job of in case encapsulating the wedding experience. Yep. I'll say I'm glad we finally got to do this epic so because I I have been, like been working towards this one for quite some time. Oh, Mickey agrees too. Did you hear that? I did. <laughs> But yeah, I think I guess we can uh, jump on over to our out of the dark segment. I'm sure Mickey has some thoughts on this as well when we get to it. (laughs) Yeah, we'll jump into that right now. So because it's Halloween, um, I'm going to let you talk, actually, Scott, because he's barking. So all right. So because it's uh, leading up to Halloween, because I believe when this episode releases, it will be October 1st. So the month of the spooky season. Um, we are. We decided that we are going to rank all of our rank all the Halloween franchise movies, including Rob Zombies as well. So I will. Um, I will start, and I will. Uh, mine's going to be pretty easy to do because it's pretty much Halloween one, two, three. Um, Halloween. So Halloween one, two. Yep. So those are tied. Like those are your top. Yep, those are my top. And then well, three. Yep. Yeah, all three. Those three are my three favorite films. You know what? I really like three, too. I think a lot of people now like three. I think you went through a stage where no one liked it and now everyone likes it. Mm -hmm. Right. It's just because no one knew what to expect out of it. Right. They were pissed that Michael Myers wasn't in it. But I think I wish they had done more like that. Yeah. So do I. Like full anthology films that are just different. So what's your fourth? My fourth would probably be Halloween or H2 by Rob Zombie. Nice. Um, Then it would be. H2O. Yeah. Then uh then Halloween 2018. Yep. Then Halloween 4, then Rob Zombie's Halloween, then Halloween 5, and then the regrettable Halloween uh Resurrection. Or- Oh, a curse of Halloween, then 
resurrection halloween resurrection oh, that man. last i think resurrection's better than curse um i love buster runs fucking fighting michael myers i think that scene is fucking <laughs> hilarious i could watch that scene forever um yeah i i think your ranking's pretty fair you know i've always liked the subplot between four and five with jamie i've always liked that yeah five just got way too hokey for me to put it right after part four like I yeah but I, I still like, I don't, because like Halloween is not one of my favorite franchises. No, I have a mug um, that someone gave to me for Halloween. Um, and I enjoy the Halloween series. So for me, um, it's one. And then I'm going to say it is uh, the 2018. Hmm. I think 2018 was a great sequel to the original. Then I'm going to say the second. Um, then I'm going to say the third. Then four, five, because I do enjoy how those two stories connect together. Uh, then H2O, then Rob Zombies, ones, one and two. And then I would say Halloween Resurrection with Buster Rhymes. Give me some more. Um, and Trick or treat, motherfucker. Oh, fuck. Like, I think that movie is hilarious. Like, that movie is fucking jokes. Like, I don't <laughs> think it is a serious fucking Michael Myers film. Oh, it's I totally think it's not. funny. I almost wish we could do a commentary. You know what? Maybe that's what we'll do. When we one day we'll do a commentary on it. Well, so for, fucking well I mean, it is October, so we could do one for Legion. We could do one for Legion, right? Because we don't have a guest lined up. So maybe, or maybe we could do our top five Halloween films that we have to watch around Halloween time. I don't know. We'll yeah, talk about it we'll later. We'll figure that out. Um, but yeah, I, I find resurrection funny. I never thought it was supposed to be taken seriously. I was supposed to be fucking stupid. I don't know. And, and Michael Myers looks super skinny and the mask looks like shit. And, you know, Jamie Lee Curtis, I don't know how they fucking got her to be in that movie. Like to this probably day, said, they probably just said, Jamie, we'll kill you off in the first five minutes. Okay. They just wrote her like a bunch of zeros. Probably half of the budget just went to her being in the movie for 50 right. seconds. Um, and isn't Vanessa Williams in that film? Oh no, Tyra Banks. That's yeah, Tyra Banks, that yeah. Um, yeah, I I I do appreciate Rom Zombie's take on the Halloween uh genre. I appreciate it more than I did before. It's just not my preference. Yeah, um, I was like, um, especially the remake. After we watched it for our remake episode, I really disliked the first half with the whole origin story. Uh, yeah, the the fucking racist and but you know bootleg grandparent trash, trash trash family and Cheryl Moon in every fucking Rob Zombie film. Like I just I. But you know what? I'll give him credit for just trying to do something different. Yeah, but that's why, again. and that's why I put H two up way before Halloween uh, remake because uh, his his sequel to that I found very uh, a very different take on what this franchise had because it was it was basically in Rob Zombie's way, but it was still covering the effects of trauma. Yes, it focused on a lot of that with trauma. Like it got it went in a very weird direction that most of the Halloween films never go. And I had to give credit I agree. for that. I agree. And you know, I like 2018 a lot. I, I, I think it's a typical Halloween film. I'm going to say this, and and you know, the first Halloween came out and it was great. Okay, mm-hmm. it, it's still great, but it's slow as fuck. Um, most people that probably watch that now would not enjoy it. Right. It was, and that's not because they don't like good movies. It's just because our tastes and interests have changed. Yes. Like if I watched AT ET now, I'd be like, what the fuck is this shit? Like this is a drama. I thought that when I was a kid. Movie, right. <laughs> but and I like Halloween. Don't get me wrong. I like it. And I like the concept of Michael Myers, but I am not like, oh my God, John Popper's Halloween is the best horror movie ever made. I think it's one of the greatest um, slashers from the seventies, hands down. I think it's really, really well done and it paved the way for a lot of other movies. But when I went to see Halloween, you know, 2018, I was like, oh yeah, this is, this is a good continuation. I thought Halloween H2O was a good continuation. Yeah. Like I, I don't mind resurrection as I've talked about a couple of times. I thought how they went with like Jamie being his sister was an interesting idea or, or sorry, Jamie Lee Curtis, it's Lori being his sister. And then Jamie, her daughter was an interesting concept. Like I didn't mind that they changed the plot several different times. I find it easier to follow than the fucking Texas Chainsaw Massacre fucking series, which I can't make sense of to save my life. Oh, that is such a mess of a series. Um, like, I feel like with this, they went one way and then they switched it. It didn't work. So I will definitely be watching 2018 and I will be going to see the new one that's coming out this year. I'm very excited yep. for that. I'll watch 2018 before I go. And um, yeah, happy Halloween, everybody. Happy month of October. And, you know, let's enjoy all our Halloween films and all the other stuff that's coming down our way. Completely agree. I'll say, and I guess so we can uh, wrap this up for uh, this week's episode. 
Um, but you know, you you know where to find us. We are on the Legion Podcast Network. So go to Legion Podcasts and uh, check out all the many varying shows that we are uh, proud members of on there. And uh, hit subscribe to any that you are interested in. Also check out our Legion Patreon page where all sorts of different uh, people from Legion are doing content for it. Uh, we had just released our uh, top five uh, monsters in film with uh, good old Derek B from Cinema Attack and uh, Celluloid Dissections and um, and also They're Here podcast. Uh, I just released that onto our main feeds, but uh, you know how we do it. Every we, When we release one, it stays on Patreon for two weeks and then we release it to you get to everyone else that's listening regularly. Uh, who knows how long we'll do that for, but we'll we'll figure that out at some point. But uh, yeah, is there anything else you would like to say, Heather? Nah, just continue to check out Halloween films. I hope people all dig Halloween that's coming out. Halloween Kills, I think it is. Yep. That's, that's the one. Um, I hope everyone likes it. I hope we all dig it. I have lots of fun. Scott and I are going to share lots of cool shit that we do over the month of October. Um, and until next time, what do you have to say to the good people, Scotty? All right. Till next time, Heather, do you take this co-host to be no stuck with you forever no 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 oh well then you guys are a podcast until I next said, time no <laughs> so until next time unpleasant dreams see ya